Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. John 8, 31 and 8, 32. If you abide in me and abide in my word, then truly you are my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 17, 17. Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Proverbs 35. Every word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So that's why here you're going to get straight scripture, no sugar. Because if you don't know what the truth is, guess what? You just, you're living in a big sea of wavering human opinion that changes every time the wind changes direction. I mean, we live in a world where everybody's right and nobody's wrong. Well, is that the truth? No, that's not the truth. Jeremiah 10, 23, O oh Lord, I know it is not in a man to know his way. So we basically live in this big world of confusion because there's no truth. Why isn't there truth? Because be people don't follow God. People don't obey God, but he is the author of truth. So if we're going to have a resolute foundation in life, if we're going to have a strong foundation to hold us up, and if we're going to have the right direction to follow, we need to know what the truth is, and that is the Word of God. That's why here you're going to get straight scripture, no sugar. So today's topic is the curse will be reversed. The curse will be reversed. Okay, so this is a sermon on the millennial kingdom. So people keep talking about the evil that is rampant in the world, the social injustice, the racism, the abject violence, the poverty, all the troubles that are plaguing this world, top to bottom, left to right, up and down, side to side. You hear about it all the time, and the news just glorifies it over and over again. And you think, well, when it, are things going to get better? You know, aren't we going to make things better? And we want world peace. We want things to be correct. We want things to be right. We want things to be just. But that's the folly of man. We think that we can correct things on our own. But we cannot because we're all flawed and we're all fallen and we all have indwelling sin within us that makes it impossible for us to rectify this fallen, wicked world. And this fallen, wicked world is run by the power of the prince of the air. That's Ephesians 2.2. 2. Who is he? He is Satan. He is a liar. He is a liar. Lies run the world. Lies run the world. Okay? So that is one of the biggest reasons there's so much abject confusion and disorder and chaos and disagreement and people at each other's throats all the time and all of this gross injustice and abuse and, and every wicked evil you can think of because the father of lies runs the world. Well, how does that happen? Well, it all has to do with him tying in to our fallen nature which is sin, which happened in the Garden of Eden. And we all inherit this. So we all have a fallen nature, and we're all subject to the lies of the world. Now, believers can resist it. Believers have power over these lies, but unbelievers do not. And the world, which does not know God, is run by, this lie, by these lies, which create all types of confusion. And there's never, ever going to be any restitution of complete justice and order and peace and righteousness until God comes down from heaven to reign on the earth as the true and righteous and just judge. Well, how can he do that? First of all, we got to get rid of Satan. Satan needs to be deposed. Satan needs to be held captive. Are, are people going to be able to do that? No way. No way. You know, Scripture does not say anything about attacking the devil. It says, resist, resist the devil and he will flee for you, flee from you. You know, James 4, 7 says that. 1 Peter 5, 9 says that. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. We're supposed to resist, but we are not going to overpower him in our own fallen flesh. By the power of God, we can resist and have victory, but ultimately, 
eradicating his evil, wicked influence in this world is only going to happen when God comes down and rules on the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so obviously what's going to happen is Satan is going to need to be imprisoned. So here we're going to Revelation 20. This is the first thing that needs to happen. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit in a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Okay, so Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years, okay? And what is he, as that scripture says? He is the deceiver of the nations, the deceiver of the nations, of the world, okay? What did Jesus say in John 8, 44? He is the liar and the father of lies. That means he's an expert liar. He is a deceiver. That is an expert liar, somebody who misleads, somebody who mixes lies with truth to deceive. That's what happens. That's what happens. He deceives. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3. What did he say to Eve when she said we can't eat from the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, otherwise we're going to die. And what did Satan say? Oh no, you're not going to die. You're going to become like God, knowing good from evil. Okay? Right there, that's the essence of it. He deceives, he misleads. So what he did with Eve there is he mixed the truth with lies. He said that Eve was going to become like God. Now, did she know good from evil? Yeah, I mean, they knew, and Adam, you know, Adam basically ate from the apple because Eve told him to, but they basically <clears throat> were deceived. They were deceived because Satan mixed the truth with lies. In one sense, they... In a very minor sense, they did become like God because they knew good from evil. On the other hand, they were not omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, completely holy. You know, Satan conveniently left that part out, right? But the point is, they were deceived, and that caused the whole world to fall into a state of sin and fallenness. And basically, that's the way Satan works in the world. He deceives and he misleads. So what happens when we have this deceiver bound for a thousand years? Well, there's going to be no more deception in the world. I mean, I can't even think of a world like that. I mean, that just the thought of that makes me think of heaven on earth. But, you know, literally it's going to come in the form of Christ. But before it comes, before Jesus rules on earth, Satan is going to be bound. So there's not going to be this deception in the world, this deception that causes all sorts of confusion and all sorts of disorder and all sorts of hostility and misunderstanding. You know, that's the way the evil world works now. But when the deceiver is basically bound for a thousand years, all that's going to go away. Great thought. Okay, so Christ is going to rule for a thousand years on earth. Well, here's how it's actually proclaimed in the second psalm. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 2 verses 7 to 9. Okay, this is Christ's inheritance. He is going to inherit the nations of the world, and he is going to rule over the nations of the world with a rod of iron, and he's going to break the nations like a potter's vessel. So he's going to have absolute authority. There is going to be 100% authority given to Christ, and he is going to rule with absolute power. And you could say, well, that seems a little bit oppressive and abusive, or no, it's not, because it's the 100% just righteous king of the universe ruling, which means there is 100% equity, there is 100% righteousness, there's no hearsay, there's no gossip, there's no corruption, there's no confusion. That's outstanding. So here, let's get into more detail about how Christ is going to rule. 
from Isaiah 11, And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Okay, here we go. He's going to judge with righteousness. He's not going to judge by what he sees, by what he hears. He's not going to go by hearsay. He's not going to go by rumor. He's not going to go by gossip. He's not going to be manipulated or bribed or uh, twisted in his own mind. He's going to rule with righteous judgment. Well, how can Jesus rule with righteous judgment? Well, he's God. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man sees the outward appearance. God sees the heart. John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. Jesus is God. He knows the heart. So he can judge with 100% righteous judgment. He not only knows what people really do, but he knows the thoughts behind the actions that drive the behavior. He is 100% righteous, so he's going to judge with 100% righteous judgment. Outstanding. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron. So justice is going to be executed in a way that is swift and that is absolute and that is 100% right and 100% fair. He's going to judge the meek of the earth. Okay, the meek... <clears throat> meek means power under control. Meek is people who submit to authority. Meek does not mean the world's definition of meek, which people think, oh, it's just some weak, spineless jellyfish. No, meek means power under control. So he's going to rule the meek. That means people are actually going to submit themselves to his authority. People who are controlled and have this power under control are going to submit to Christ's authority, and he is going to judge with 100% equity and 100% righteous judgment. Now listen to this, it gets even better, from Zephaniah. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. Okay, serving Him with one accord. Everybody's going to be in agreement. There's going to be one language. You know, you think about the confusion and the disorder in the world now, all that's going to be gone. There's going to be one language and everybody's going to agree. And why does everybody agree? Because everybody submits to Christ's authority. When the millennial kingdom starts, Jesus talks about this, the judgment of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. People at the end of the tribulation who survive the tribulation, uh, people who go into the kingdom alive, are going to be followers of Christ, right? And then the goats, those are the sheep, the goats are going to be separated and they're going to be sent to hell. So when the millennial kingdom starts, everybody is going to be subject to Christ. Everybody is going to be of one accord, right? It's not going to be a matter of, well, I think apples and I think oranges and I think pears. No, no. These are going to be people who submit to Christ's authority, believers in Christ. They're going to be um, basically supernaturally glorified believers, ruling with Christ on earth, and then the people who go alive into the kingdom on earth are going to be believers in Christ. So everybody is going to be of one accord, and there's going to be one language. Outstanding. Okay, one more from... Uh, Two other quick ones here. Here's another one from Zephaniah. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Zephaniah 3.12. Here's one from Isaiah 11. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay? Everybody's humble. Everybody trusts in the Lord. Everybody is of one accord. Everybody is completely in agreement. And the world is full of the knowledge of the Lord. The world is full of the knowledge of the Lord. Go to Proverbs 1.7. Right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay? People are going to have God's knowledge. Fear of the Lord, Proverbs 9.10, 
is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Okay? So, this millennial kingdom is going to begin with people who have God's knowledge, who have God's wisdom, because they fear Him and they come to Him, and they basically, their souls have been restored through the Holy Spirit. Their souls have been renewed by the transforming of their mind, which is God's knowledge and God's wisdom. So this kingdom is going to be full of God's servants who are of one accord, who are humble, who are meek, which means power under control. They submit to God's authority. They are in complete agreement, and they all have God's wisdom and knowledge. You know, that's blessing beyond blessing. <clears throat> All right, so one other verse here from Micah about how Christ is going to rule. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Micah chapter 4, verse 3. Okay, so he's going to judge with absolute authority. He's going to rule the nations, whether they're, you know, 100 miles from Jerusalem. He's going to rule from Jerusalem, or the, they're on the other side of the earth. Um, it doesn't matter. He's going to rule them, and he's going to rule with a rod of iron. There's going to be uh, quick and equitable justice executed. And not only that, guess what? There's going to be peace. Peace on earth. Everybody talks about it. All the time, world peace, world peace, world peace. Well, when you have a bunch of fallen human beings who are driven by lust and sin and who are at each other's throats all the time, it's impossible to have world peace. But when the righteous judge comes down from heaven to rule on earth and he separates the wicked from the just, then you are going to have peace. You are going to have peace on earth. But God has to rule on earth for there to be this peace on earth, and he will rule with equitable judgment and equitable justice, and he will rule with righteous judgment. And because of that, guess what? There is going to be peace on earth. Swords will turn into plowshares, okay? Swords will turn into plowshares, and spears will turn into pruning hooks. You know, so basically there's going to be an agricultural abundance and the earth is going to produce in a way that it, it never ever has before. And there's going to be this tremendous peace and, a, and abundance and, and the, the earth is actually going to blossom like a rose. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Um, <clears throat> so here's another verse from Zechariah. What's going to happen when Jesus actually comes back right at the end of the tribulation, what he's going to do is he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And here we're going to actually see what happens with the physical landscape when Jesus himself changes it to make the desert blossom like a rose. Okay, here's what happens. This is from Zechariah uh, 14. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Zechariah verse, uh, chapter 14, verses 3 to 4. Okay, that's amazing. So he is literally going to stand on the Mount of Olives. This is not some sort of nebulous dream. He's going to stand on it, and it's going, to, it's going to break. You know, half of it's going to go to the north, half of it's going to go to south. There's going to be this huge valley created. And this is going to be also for some of the captive Jews who are in Jerusalem at the time to escape so they will survive the end of the tribulation. But what else is going to happen here? There's going to be a massive renovation of the landscape. Okay, this is from Isaiah 35. Here's what's going to happen. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Isaiah 35, verses 1 to 2. Okay, if we go to Romans 8, Romans 8 talks about the whole of creation groaning out for restitution. Okay? 
the creation, the fallen creation groaning for restitution. Here in Isaiah 35, we have the creation singing and rejoicing. So we have the pain and the groaning that comes with the fall. Now we have the restoration of the earth, so it's almost going to return to Eden-like conditions. And now the creation is singing, okay? The desert shall rejoice and blossom. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. With joy and singing, okay? Let's get into some more detail. Here's one from Zechariah 14. And in that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. Zechariah 14, verse 8. Living waters flowing from Jerusalem. Living waters flowing from Jerusalem. So they're going to flow to the sea on the west, which is the Mediterranean, the sea on the east, which is the Dead Sea. Rivers of living water, okay, it's flowing, it's flowing, it's abundant, okay. This is part of the desert blossoming like a rose. So the ground is going to produce in ways that it never, never has before. And there's just going to be abundance beyond abundance. I mean, the, the grass and, and all the trees and all the vegetation is going to be as lush as it has ever been. And, and the world, you know, the desert's going to blossom like a rose. It's going to be amazing. And this river that's coming from Jerusalem, it's going to be living water. It's going to be like a fountain gushing up and flowing over. Amazing. So let's see what kind of produce the earth is going to produce in this millennial kingdom. Along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Okay. Bearing fruit every single month. Bearing fruit every single month. Okay. And their fruit's going to be for food and their leaves for medicine on both sides of the river. I mean, this, this is going to be abundance. I mean, how many uh, trees actually bear fruit every month of the year? Well... And there might be one, um, and I'm not an agricultural expert, but there, I think there are some trees in India that actually produce fruit uh, every month of the year, but it's, it's extremely rare on this earth. But now you're going to have in the Millennial Kingdom, you're going to have trees that produce in abundance, so they bear fruit all the time, every month of the year. There's never an off-season. There's never a time where shoots need to actually regrow and there isn't going to be a time when the trees flower and produce fruit later. They're going to produce fruit every month of the year, all the time, in abundance and variety beyond compare. And the leaves of the trees are going to be used for medicine. So you have medicinal purposes that are going to come from these trees as well. So you're going to have a level of health and a level of uh, strength and a level of satisfaction and a level of uh, vitality and vigor that has never existed in the world until this time. Okay, not only that, there's going to be a restoration of the animal kingdom. There are not going to be any more carnivores in the animal kingdom. Listen to this. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy, nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Isaiah 65, 25. Okay. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The wolf and the sheep will lie down, to, or the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. There's no more, you know, aggression or... Uh, predatory nature in the animal kingdom. They're all at peace with one another. That's amazing, you know? I mean, if you think like a, uh, of a cheetah chasing a gazelle in the Serengeti or a lion chasing a gazelle and, and how brutal that kind of attack is and how brutal that kind of killing is, think about that being completely gone and having that lion there sitting there eating straw or they're both sitting there next to each other and they're both eating straw. That's what's going to happen. No more carnivores 
in the animal kingdom. No more prey, no more predators. Peace. They shall not destroy in all my holy mountain. Okay, that's amazing. <clears throat> One more verse from Isaiah 65. So not only that, not only is the desert going to blossom like a rose, not only are carnivores and predators going to be removed from the animal kingdom, they'll all, they'll all be at peace with one another. Not only will all of the people on the earth be at peace with one another, but life is going to return to a longevity that hasn't existed since before the flood of Noah. Listen to this. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old. Isaiah 65, 20. So even when somebody dies, they're going to die as a child at 100 years old. 100 years old as a child. Okay, this goes back to before the flood. I mean, before the flood, there was a water can canopy over the earth that basically prevented the ultraviolet rays that come down from the sun from penetrating the atmosphere. And, and people live for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you go back to the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, you can read about how people lived hundreds and hundreds of years. And Methuselah, who's the man who lived the longest, who lived over 700 years, um, you know, is it going to be to that extent? I don't know, but it does say if somebody dies at 100, they're going to die as a child. So there's going to be a longevity of life on this earth that is just going to be incredible. We can't even conceive of it in this day and age. That kind of long, fruitful, abundant life. So you think about that in the Millennial Kingdom. Not only are you going to have peace on earth, not only are you going to have the perfect, righteous judge, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Okay, so if you have the way and the truth and the life ruling with perfect, equitable rule from Jerusalem over all the nations of the earth and executing justice swiftly and righteously, not based on looks not based on appearances, not based on what people say, but with 100% righteousness and equity, and all the people on the earth are going to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and they're going to be in complete accordance and complete agreement, and there's going to be one language, and there's going to be no confusion and no disorder, because the devil, the deceiver, is going to be uh, locked up in the pit, can you imagine that? Desert blossoming, blossoming like a rose. No more carnivores or predators in the animal kingdom. The earth producing in a way it's never produced. Um, there's going to be an abundance of agricultural life. Peace between all the nations. This is the millennial kingdom. There will be peace on earth. There will be world, world peace. There will be equity. There will be righteous judgment. There will be harmony. There will be order. There will be abundance that nobody has, can ever really conceive of. But in order for that to happen, to happen, God needs to eradicate the sinners and the sin from the world. He needs to come down and bind the deceiver in the pit. And he needs to rule from Jerusalem. And it will happen. But it will not happen until the Millennial Kingdom. That is when the curse will be reversed. You know, man cannot stop all the problems and all the evils of this world because it's a fallen world full of fallen people, full of sinners who are driven by lust and are driven by Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air. We know the whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. 1 John 5, 19. He is a liar. He deceives. And because of all this deception, we get all this confusion. And we get all this trouble. And we get all this injustice. And we get all this disorder. And we get all this conflict and trouble. But when God comes down to eradicate all that in the person of Christ, and He rules from Jerusalem, we will have world peace and we will have unity, and there will be harmony that will literally bring 
heaven to earth. Now, not in its fullness, because there are going to be people who go into the kingdom of God in their natural bodies who are not yet glorified. So they're still going to have sin dwelling within them, and eventually what's going to happen, there's going to be, after that a thousand years, there's going to be an ultimate rebellion that is going to be destroyed by God, and then we're going to have the new heavens and the new earth, and then there's going to be the eternal state. But in the meantime, Christ is going to gain this inheritance of this millennial kingdom. He is going to receive the nations. He is going to rule with justice and equity. And there is going to be peace and harmony on earth, which is going to be the closest thing to heaven on earth that we'll ever see. But it will happen, and it is going to happen when the curse is reversed. So how can we be part of this millennial kingdom? How can we be there with Christ when indeed the curse is reversed? Well, we have to accept Him as Lord. We have to confess Him as Lord because all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. That's Romans 3.23, Romans 3.10. There's not one righteous, not one. There's not one who understands or seeks after God. We all have a sinful nature that separates us from God temporally and eternally. And without the perfect atonement of the sinless man, the man who knew no sin, that's Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us, so in him we might become the righteousness of God. Without the atoning work of Christ on the cross, we are separated forever from God, which sends us to hell. That's why we need to be in Christ, because he pays the price for our sin. Isaiah 53, uh, 5, he was pierced for our uh, transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The penalty of our peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So the atoning work of Christ makes us righteous with God, and that allows us to enjoy his blessing forever in the millennial kingdom, and temporal blessing, and eternal blessing. And it says in Daniel 7.18 that the saints of the Most High are going to <clears throat> receive this kingdom. The saints of the Most High will receive this kingdom, and it will be their possession forever, even forever and ever. So the only way that that's possible is if we confess Christ as Lord, and then we will reign with Him in the Millennial Kingdom. So that's been today's sermon. There are several other sermons on this website. It's called Straight Scripture, No Sugar. And you can get to the site at getbibletruth.com and there are many other sermons that deal with very topical issues from Genesis to Revelation. And that has been today's sermon. And my name is John Parisi. I thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Amen.